the initial uh, part of india ai project we were profiling most of the prominent ai startups you know you got the nikki ai and all the haptic all the early players and one startup that always caught my interest was nirmai one reason is how you managed to have the ai part in the name second part was the purpose right i mean you see all the when almost all of this let's say the pioneering ai startups you know after 2015 this years they were all in a consumer area basically working on chatbots or uh, working in retail you had this startup which absolutely taking a different course and saying you know we want to make uh, a cancer screening affordable that's the i think i i personally i was talking to uh aka you know ashika also feel that's the point that i was also got inspired personally you know what all the time the ai work i have been you know connected towards is mostly consumer electronics you know the series the alexa you know nlps all those things and here is a different model so uh, i am want to say on this month you know the breast cancer awareness month it's a privilege for me to have this conversation with you uh, dr geeta and uh, and it, i consider myself uh, very lucky to have this conversation and so can you tell me how the how your journey started uh, to niramai sure thank you very much uh, uh, mr jibu for your kind comments and uh, really appreciate uh, all the nice things you said about me um uh, basically i am an accidental entrepreneur <laughs> i was a computer scientist i am a computer scientist and an innovator if you will broadly um i was a lab director at a um, um, multinational company so rocks research before that you let packard research for over 17 years and i hold a phd from the university of science in the ai topic and uh, also a management degree from kellogg so with that kind of a background i was actually a lab director and so sort of we had multiple pro- uh, pro- uh, projects sorry uh, we had multiple projects uh, in my lab which is an ai lab essentially data science lab um we were catering to education uh, related use cases customer care related use cases um you know we were as transportation of smart cities uh, uh, you know uh, use cases and also healthcare you know? um as a multinational company our focus was mainly on europe and uh, us uh, markets and then trying to see how ai can help in the sort of um moving the business front and so on and at that time we did uh, have a small initiative for emerging markets uh, you know um uh, my manager at that time nish gupta ji and uh, you know, we were working together on this uh, um services for emerging market in this exploratory activity we were also were working with local hospitals to try and see what else we can do and it was like uh, can i predict uh, a particular disease happening uh let's say for example uh, when a person is in the icu can we predict when the person is likely to sort of die and so so you can actually sort of prioritize the patient and save the patient and these kinds of things and on that time one of my cousin sisters um bharti uh, she got detected with breast cancer she was around 40 years uh, that's about it and uh, it was late stage suddenly and um, i got uh, really disturbed you know very disturbed because um, you know uh she was very close to me and so on and suddenly you know you see that uh, just a person who is next to you suddenly uh, and the doctor says a few more months to go so it's really really shocking and that's when i started reading about breast cancer and so on and um, um you know within 6 months my you know, um husband's cousin also got the same thing so it was really uh, you know reemphasizing the need for something in this space which is uh, which is not available today so i uh, started reading again and could be serendipity i would say that i started discussing with my colleagues and uh, uh, mr mesta dr mesta uh, he mentioned to me about the thermal imaging he said you know have you looked at it you know um, long back you know, it was used and uh, he he is a, a multi spectral imaging specialist so he said okay this is something that i've been used before so i started reading about it and then with a the, uh, you know some support uh, we started a project uh um, just to sort of explore thermal imaging and i'll tell a little bit more about why that's better than the other so once i started uh, spending my night times and sort of weekends and all that and uh, uh one or two um, part part time researchers uh, sort of we developed some uh, initial elements and i thought use of machine learning may be helpful to increase the accuracy so we started experimenting with machine learning and after about uh, one and a half to two years of research i said okay uh i can't be doing this only on weekends and uh, you know nights so i quit my job 
and uh, started Niramai. Uh, Niramai means uh, being healthy. Sarve uh, Santu Niramaya, like everyone be healthy is our motto. Um, it's, a, it's a line from the Sabeed Vedas. And um, uh, we have an expansion that's a non invasive risk assessment through machine artificial intelligence. So, uh, so that's, that's how uh, you know, uh, we started you know, my, uh, me and my, uh, one of my uh, team members, uh, product managers, Nidhi Mathur. So, both of us were co founders, but we have a co founding team, Shiva and Himanshu, who would also uh, definitely be part of this whole effort. It's it's a very uh, motivating and inspiring journey. I had to say, Gida, uh, Doctor Gida. So the, the thing is, I mean, I I had done like as as a part of someone in this uh, area. I had to I had a conversation very recently with Amit Amit Sethi of IIT Bombay, who works in sure. uh, medical uh, data and things like that. So um, we were talking about cancer diagnostic in particular. You know, there are many options out there. You know, you got digital mammography, natomosynthesis. Then, then you yeah. you guys developed uh, thermal thermalytics. So, how is this uh, different from the other existing uh, methods in the field? Yeah. Um, yes, you're absolutely right. First of all, I want to say that you know breast cancer is a major problem today. About uh, twenty five percent of all cancers is breast cancer. About mm, about more than half a million, like six hundred thousand people die every year because of this disease. And then. Um, uh, 15% of the deaths are happening in India because of late detection. Now, when you look at the current methods, which you mentioned, right, a mammography, which is, a, which is actually proven to increase uh, survival rates um, when used regularly. Uh, having said that, it does work and is recommended only about 40 or 45 years of age, depending on which country and which guideline you look at. Uh, because of that, um, uh, you know, women under 45 years of age do not have a regular test that they can go to. Um, sometimes uh, sonomammography or ultrasound is used, but that is extremely skill dependent and it's uh, very hard to actually sort of find uh, small uh, cancers uh, with, with the, um, you know, just sonomammography. You always need to use this as a correlation modality. Now with that into the picture, um, um, what happens is that there is a huge gap for women under 45 years of age. In fact, even for women above 45 years of age, there's what's called as dense breast, which is uh, there are more fibroglandular tissue in the breast, in which case, you know, uh, when you take a mammogram, which is basically X-ray of the breast, uh, where the breast is compressed between the two plates and X-rays are passed from top to bottom, uh, you'll be able to find small lumps. You know, that's the principle uh, by, by, because it will be white in color and so on. That's the principle in which this works. And um, uh, so that will not work for women under 45 years of age and women with dense breasts because the whole breast will appear white and you're trying to find a white spot. And that's a huge limitation because the, the, it's a physics limitation. It's not about mammography or anything. It's a physics limitation that if you use density differences, the only thing you can find is lumps. And uh, you know early classifications, we say, you can find it. But you will not be able to easily find it in dense breasts because obviously density differences are disappear. So that's uh, that being the baseline, we decided, you know, why use X-rays? You know, can we use some other modality? That's where the thermal imaging aspect, which I briefly mentioned before, comes into the picture. When you use thermal imaging, what happens is that um, it tries to give the temperature. It actually gives the temperature on the skin, which basically mimics the metabolic activity that is happening be behind the skin in some sense. So what happens when there is a cancer cell is there is higher mitotic activity. There is higher cell division, irregular cell division. And that uh, results in an increase in temperature at the tumor area, as well as there is more blood flow to feed to these uh, cells. And so that results in some kind of an abnormal pattern around the lesion. So all these can be sort of, uh, you know, seen in the thermal image. I say sort of because it's not easily seen. Like, you know, you can't just look at it and say, yeah, this is the thing, right? For late stage, you can always see an asymmetry, right? You know, uh, one side will be sort of much redder in nature, another side is not. And you can see it for late stages. Having said that, for early stage detection or even regular screening, a hand examination or just a sort of bare eyes kind of manual examination is not sufficient. That's why we bring in the machine learning part. Thermalytics is thermal analytics, which is thermal images and analysis over thermal images. And that's where we have developed uh, novel algorithms to analyze and um, uh, you know, predict uh, the probability or likelihood that it is uh, you know, malignant or it, uh, abnormal in general. And also we mark the area of malignancy automatically. We say, okay, here is a problem. 
likely to be a problem, you know, most likely to be a problem. It's not a final diagnosis because after our test, we say, why don't you do an ultrasound at this area? If ultrasound is done on a targeted area, it's very effective and can be done by everyone. So that's what we point to. And based on uh, ultrasound results, uh, uh, further treatment or, you know, biopsy and other, uh, you know, final diagnosis can be uh, performed. It so is, another thing that I forgot yes, to add please, please, is, uh, sorry, another thing I forgot to add is that uh, it's a completely non-invasive test. You know, it is radiation free because we just uh, measure the temperature. There is no x-ray. So there's no side effect at all. Secondly, it's a privacy ever in the sense it's a booth where the lady enters and sits in front of the imaging device and she gets out after 10 minutes that's it nobody would have seen her nobody would have touched her of course she has to remove the top clothes because that's the only way breast cancer screening can be done but nobody would have seen her so i call it changing room experience you know how many of us go and try out new clothes in malls right obviously the door is closed that's exactly the experience we give so we have seen so many women adopt it because of that uh, privacy of nature and stuff uh, not just a uh, changing room, even in uh, security check, we had to go through a process where we just much invasive and <laughs> we still had right. to go through. So considering that, this is a, a blessing, I will say. So this technology is efficient on, I mean, uh, there are uh, multiple times, uh, kinds of breast cancer, like you got uh, metastatic breast cancer or ductal carcinoma. So this is applicable in uh, all, all of these cases as well. Yeah, it's uh, locally invasive cancer. I mean, so whatever is related to the breast, uh, that will be uh, caught because uh, typically what happens is uh, there's something called a segmentation process. We say, okay, what area of the chest region you want to analyze? And we also have to do an automatic segmentation. We sort of figure out what is the breast region and do the analysis. Uh, we also analyze the axilla, which is like below the like uh, arms, below the arms where, uh, uh, you know, you'll see lymph node metastasis. So that can be detected. But the rest of the metastasis, because uh, sometimes really late stage uh, breast cancer, uh, you know, can lead to cancer in the brain, lung and other parts of the body. So those things are not included in the current uh, version. Having said that, you know, in the long run, we could do a, like a full body analysis and try and come up with some other uh, additional elements. So this is basically a first screening or uh, early diagnosis uh, tool for breast cancer. So uh, yeah, it can correct. detect uh, amazing cancer or DCIS and many of these. Uh, so if, if, I'm if, if, if I'm correct, uh, thermalitis pretty much looks for the rapid multiplication of tissue cells. Uh, so uh, abnormal tissue activity. Abdo yeah, so the, so the, right? then it can be replicated in uh, other parts of body as well. Yeah, it can. Be. It can be. But uh, uh, right now, uh, clinically proven results are for breast cancer. Yes. And uh, we are very happy to collaborate with uh, other doctors. And a lot of people have come forward also. We are evaluating which is the next size. For example, head and neck cancer is coming out, prostate, cervical. So all of these can be also, uh, you know, evaluated to see where is the highest effectiveness. Because of the non-contact nature, and also we have a portable device, right? It's a handheld device also, or you can fix it on a tripod, depends on what part of the body you're imaging. Uh, so that makes it very simple uh, to uh, to also image. You know, Non-invasive nature is very, very important. So I, I remember uh, going through one of the proceedings of the Santa Antonio's uh, conference, I think it happened in 2018. <laughs> Uh, San yes. Jose, I think, uh, yeah, San Antonio, Texas, yes. So uh, there you you co-authored, I mean, Nirma I, uh, presented a paper and uh, it, it's claimed to have 90% sensi sensitivity rate uh, on the detection of breast cancer, which is, I feel it's incredible because uh, by going through all other papers recently appeared in both Nature as well as Lancet, uh, I, I mean, especially in terms of digital mammography, the sensitivity seems to be somewhere around 70 to 84 percent is the average and uh, so uh, do you are we in a position where we can say that uh, you know these uh, tools are can provide a more accurate result compared to a radiologist at this point i mean using the traditional methods so uh, what i would say is is definitely more sensitive than x-ray based analysis hmm. because as you know mammography is also interpreted by radiologists and uh, you know, it's, it's really not about uh, whether uh, the tool can replace radiologists or not. It's, it's about uh, being an additional tool for a final diagnosis of the, uh, of the cancer of the patient itself. Um, having said that, uh, when we do rural camps, you know, where it's difficult to uh, take a radiologist along, and also we can't even wait for 15 minutes for a doctor to come and review, because there are these lines of people, they come in, they review, and then they go away. You know, they come from far off villages, they go away, right? So you have to provide immediate, real, literally real-time results have to be provided. 
So that is a place where we have enhanced the solution to be provisional reporting, not the full-fledged reporting of whether you know there's any major abnormality or, or specific abnormality at this place or not. So there we gave what is called as a red, yellow, green or a traffic light output. That's all. It's like, you know, if it is red, please come to the side. You know, we may want to do a re-examination. Hello, you know, come back in about six months and green chicken go home. And these red people, they actually take more information about uh, her contacts and which village and, uh, you know, neighbor and like son, husband. So because there are several of these nuances, many of them may not even have a mobile phone. They'll be using their husband's mobile phone. So all of this data we will be capturing and then we'll follow up only for those people. Because otherwise, you know, it's very hard to get, uh, get mammography to the villages and then do it at that scale. And more importantly, do the interpretation at that uh, you know speed, right? even if it is uh, teleradiology, it's very hard to do that. So in those cases, yes, we use the tool alone uh, in a provisional uh, fashion. Um, um, uh, whereas in the hospitals, uh, our report is also reviewed by a radiologist because the radiologist has several other information about the patient. Many other tests can could have been conducted and they may see something additional uh, you know, in the reports. So we give a quantitative report with scores and then send it to a radiologist. We the radiologist can also review it on a phone. We have a, a mobile app called Mirai Doctor that can be downloaded by the doctor and review the reports uh, that are assigned to the doctor. And then only certified reports are given to um, the end users, so that we ensure. So it's really not about replacing doctors; it's uh, it's uh, making them more scalable and more productive. I would say in an urban scenario, and uh, enabling um, you know uh, affordable and high quality care even uh, outside the you know tier one cities or even villages and so on. So I think that's very very critical, and I feel very deeply about that problem in India. I completely agree with you. So one of the, like you said, the breast cancer is one of the, considering that, you know, women are half of the population, yet the, to the total number, the volume of breast cancer patients is higher. And the fact that in our, uh, considering the sensitive nature of rural India and lack of access in rural India, this is a very serious uh, way to address some of the problem. I mean, there is a general tendency to believe that cancer is, oh, you know, obviously around urban area because of, environmental pollution all these things but uh, even i work closely with many ngos and you can see many rural areas the problem is you end up diagnosing in the last part of the stage you know and very recently uh, someone who is very close to me she is 75 she was taken into hospital for uh, tb but uh, further ultrasound they realize it's a cancer and it has uh, expanded to her ribs and now it's like it's a waiting game right so oh, in that yeah. Uh, in, in, in that case, something like uh, what Nirama is doing, right? How you can uh, implement this, uh, you know, go to the villages. I mean, the key part is informing them, you know, there is something wrong that you need to check it out so that they can go to the next town or city where they can get better. I think that first uh, stage is very crucial. And I'm, I'm very happy to hear the work you, you, you know, Nirama has been doing. So how can we scale this up? What are the challenges uh, right now Nirmai or anyone else coming into this space have in terms of scaling up? Yeah. So um, obviously, uh, you know, a small team cannot solve a whole, uh, you know, whole uh, a big problem which is uh, attacking the world, right? Yeah. So we look for collaborations and partnerships. And uh, in particular, uh, you know, we talked about rural scaling. And so for that rural scaling uh, of the test itself, uh, we partner with uh, cancer societies, NGOs, nonprofit organizations who actually have all the capacity to bring people together, you know, to spread awareness at that. On and of course, we're very much looking forward to partner with government at that scale, right? You know, the PHC level, uh, in order to take these uh, solutions there. And then at the urban level, also, it's a very important problem. We talked about how you know women under 45 do not have a test, and also women with dentists, which is almost 50% of the ladies above 45. So for these people, uh, you know, we partner with clinical uh, experts, uh, particularly in diagnostic centers and hospitals, to provide the solution uh, as as one of the tests, like a preventative screening or general test that people, any lady coming in, can take this test, uh, you know, in in the hospital. Um, and for this, uh, we also have uh, partners in almost uh, you know every state. Uh, we are uh, recruiting partners in some of the states, but many states. Uh, we, our solution is already installed in about 14 cities today. Um, and um, you know, for example, Bangalore, uh, Mysore, Hyderabad, Pune, you know, Delhi, Mumbai, Dehradun, Orissa. 
So many of these places, which Chennai, all of these places we do have. And um, some of it is uh, delivered through the partner. So once the partner is basically sell the solution, frame them, and they become experts in doing the solution themselves. For example, our Hyderabad partner, we have a center called Mumang. It's, it's, it's just in a mall. You know, it's like a simple, um, like a shop. You know, one could go before buying the sari, should go get that done. And you know, it's just as simple as that because nobody sees, as I said, right? So, so they're also doing uh, camps around it. So it's like a station place because our equipment is uh, very simple. It's a small uh, device, just like a one liter water bottle. So you can actually install in a hospital as well as do the new camp. So we have the station, you know, like a hub and spoke angle to it uh, for the scale up. So that is done. And uh, yes, we are partnering and we're also partnering with diagnostic chains. And recently you would have heard uh, we partnered with Apollo Clinics. And uh, right now we're providing all Apollo Clinics in four cities. Um, this particular solution and it's appointment based a uh, person can take an appointment from a clinic and uh, we let the device go there and do the screening uh, and then we plan to expand uh, uh, pan india and also partner with other diagnostic centers who are up, you know coming up to actually do this because the other beautiful thing is it's no contact it's also covid friendly right and uh, when people are not coming into the hospital uh, because of this pandemic issue and scared of getting infected uh, we have also launched home screening. So, you know, anyone can come into our website and register for screening with their pin code. Our team will call up and then set up an appointment and we send the technician with the equipment to their home, right? This is the first ever time cancer screening is done at home. And uh, so I really actually urge everyone to make use of this. I would, I would not, that, but that's how we are scaling right now. This is ex exciting, uh, Gida, because I mean, this is these are the things that actually inspire me to look into AI as this technology that is capable of uh, making these things accessible, right? I mean, uh, I mean, you mentioned the challenges had in this area, and uh, I also noticed that one of the things, one of the constant criticism any uh, startup or a product in healthcare sector gets, I mean, many notable people points out is that see, you can get a good result for a you know paper you know you publish it in lancet or springer or nature with a particular data set but that won't be the case when you go into a production settings and uh, the yeah. case of nirmai seems to be totally uh, opposite to that because you are you guys are doing quite well in a real life real scenario and uh, that's been uh, fascinating yeah no actually there are challenges i mean uh, uh, we were taking many more steps initially of course it was working inside a lab and then the first thing we did was a clinical validation in a real setting. You know, the way you train and test a model inside a lab is very different from how you test a model to be used outside. It's like, uh, how does the model behave for an unseen data, right? That's very, very important. Uh, it's called as prospective setting. That is, when you don't know the label, are you able to predict? I mean, it sounds so silly. Of course, if you don't know the label, you have to predict. But that's exactly how uh, it has to be tested and it is not tested. All the AI models in the lab are not tested that way. Generally, it's based on several other, like cross validation and so on. You know, the labels will be known. I mean, maybe it's not known to the model, but it's known to the person who is training the model. So there's always this bias to make it look good on the training uh, testing set and sort of choose the training set up appropriately and so on. Whereas in our case, uh, you know, we really, really don't know the answer and the person is coming in. And so we had to do deep uh, technical trials, uh, clinical trials, sorry, sorry uh, where, uh, you know, uh, the person comes and takes our test and we give the result and there's an external body who, who will also look at what their mammography and ultrasound tests are they compare and then actually do the publication so all this uh you know it's that's the reason why we took three hours three years almost to kind of scale up we did it like one by one by one in mean, making sure that we're doing the right thing and uh now we have screened about uh, more than thirty-two thousand women and uh, published in you know, six international conferences and journals the latest one is an ASCO JCO, which is one of the top tier conferences, uh, sorry, journal papers that we have uh, published. So with this, uh, I think, um, and also there's a lot of innovation that's gone in. It's not like, uh, you know, just took the images and sort of churned it through a deep learning network, which is pre-trained. You know, it's not been that way. There's a lot of semantic, uh, you know, uh, data engineering, data science and, and novelty that's gone in, which has resulted in 10 granted US patents. You know, that's just the sort of the novelty that has gone into the algorithm design itself. Um, is unique. So, so um, well, thanks to our wonderful team, uh, you know, a lot of ideas, bright ideas. We brainstorm a lot and, uh, you know, uh, we are here. And uh, as a technologist, I feel very good, just like what you said, right? 
how can a technology predict uh, you know so well you know especially we have asymptomatic sensitivity of 100 percent it's like oh my god i keep touching wood and saying okay we shouldn't be saying any case right so i mean it's really so that's also so since uh, you mentioned the specificity rate of 100% that's uh, that's very yeah. uh, you know that's uh, almost uh, like, like impossible to accomplish but uh, yeah, so both 100% is absolutely impossible yes. like sensitivity and specificity, specificity yeah sensitivity is uh, 100% specificity is about 94% means basically we may call out a few people who are not cancer yeah. as so we do not actually say cancer or no we just ask them to go for a follow up test and that's hmm. the main thing we find so even if we, if neuromite test say positive it could be maybe like a deep infection right you know which which can come out as a higher metabolism there it's also good for her to show it to the end so that is what our main aim so i i mean i've been going through some of the you know the machine learning models and everything developed for covid diagnostics and you see this general pattern you have around 90% uh, sensitivity but the specificity will be like 40% or uh, you know 50% maximum and uh, i think yes. this is this is a wonderful news so uh, gida as a as a uh, you know accidental entrepreneur but now a successful uh, entrepreneur and quite inspiring uh, person as well how i have i want to have two questions to you one is on a personal level and another is on a general uh, national level so my sure. personal level question is it is quite challenging as we know we live in a society where uh, rules are different for man and woman you know and, and i feel probably saying even saying that you know i'm not happy about saying that but we know the reasons right and it's always been what i have seen uh, in in the work environment or everywhere a woman has to be twice good as a man to be in the same position and uh, because of that i was blessed with so many good mentors you know because they are always best at what they do so in that case how difficult was your challenge as an entrepreneur i mean you you know, co-founder were both a uh, you know, woman and uh, what is your uh, message for other female entrepreneurs out there yeah uh, definitely it's challenging i'm not going to sort of reduce that uh, it's like that right so if you suddenly find a lady driving a, a pilot you know yeah, sorry a lady pilot in in the flight or a lady bus conductor you suddenly feel ha huh, how is like you know suddenly there is a different uh, in the same way right you know a business should be run by men right so um yeah so that outlook is there so there is some kind of a doubt uh, all the time when you say some things and so on but a uh, couple of things i think it's about uh, being ready with some uh, facts uh, whenever there is uh, a question raised and uh, and then showing with uh, with some proof points and it's not just for entrepreneurship i think it's true for any uh, you know senior technical role you know the innovative innovation uh, role that i have played before also in all of these cases i used to be sort of the only lady in the t- uh, around the table and all those kinds of things so so basically in shit it's it's extremely uh, you know you're awed by the fact that you know i i don't and, and i'm not by nature outgoing you know so it's very difficult for me to sort of break up the shyness and come out but then what happens your uh, the theme that you're going after right you know you are looking at i mean so many ladies can benefit and if i shut up and don't talk and you know i'm actually not doing injustice to so that gives me the power to speak up and uh, explain uh, you know what i think is a good idea to uh, share it in the table and it's possible that people may laugh at me let them laugh i mean because at the end of the day if you start caring too much about outside right you, know, you can't do what you want to do so i think that is one thing it's very hard to get to that mindset i i'm still not saying i'm 100% there but it does hurt me and i go back and oh, oh but still right you know that is one thing gaining the courage to speak up what you think is right i think is is very much important and you need to train that uh, you know even when there's like the small girls we are seeing like that leadership type of qualities more now but that needs to be done so that's definitely a challenge and so typically you end up doing double the work um, uh, you know possibly um, before saying a statement uh, than an uh, than a male colleague and um, yeah and also your perceived whenever you say the statement the other person is perceiving it as maybe it's half true right so it's like really <laughs> uh, crazy sometimes and so you come up with some facts and all then they say you're being defensive no i have all the results ready because i'm expecting this question so it's pretty hard um, um but i think uh, because we are solving a women's problem uh, today um you know some of the people also perceive that we can understand those problems much better than let's say a male uh, uh, but uh, we do have considerable uh, male colleagues uh, in in our team as well although we are about 60% women 
um, I mean, it's, it's, I think it's just the teamwork uh, that can finally uh, take you through there. But you'll have to find the voice to speak up. That's all I would, I would just uh, encourage all ladies and girls to do this. That's that's truly inspiring. Uh, one more question. Uh, now, we, we were talking about I mean, the overall theme, something I'm also very curious about is, how can we make healthcare? We, we spoke about uh, cancer screening, but other parts of healthcare, how can we make all these things more accessible to rural India? You know, that's the biggest challenge, right? Like, uh, if we can talk about, you know, using a tool like Naramai for a radiologist in a city like Bangalore or uh, Cochin or uh, Chennai or Delhi or Mumbai, but there are towns or villages where you don't, you can't even have a proper uh, screening facility or a radiologist a hospital, you know, they, you know, all, all these public facilities and, and some of the states, I mean, many of the states in our country's public health care system are not up to wa- where our uh, pe- ready to meet our people's le- need and aspirations. So how can we leverage this power? Like what uh, Nirma is doing with uh, breast cancer, how can we leverage AI to have this a- a- a approach towards the healthcare system where especially diagnosis can be made very easy and accessible in, in other uh, other uh, you know areas as well sure yeah definitely it's a very good question Jibu. um i think uh, there are two things that need to be done right so one is uh, organized screening programs you know so because uh, one way is to actually set up those centers in every village and that becomes uh, you know too expensive for us to manage because it also for the fact that it may not be fully utilized, you know, if you uh, invest in the small equipments that you want to use for. So, so having some kind of good screening programs, um, you know, maybe like a mobile van where you have all of the stuff and it goes like uh, maybe even once a month to every village. That is good enough to screen all of the people. So that is one in more from a structural and organizational perspective. And second is provide these AI based tools inside this or like, you know, of course, it may not be running inside the machine, inside the bus, sorry, it can be taken out and we have done the camps inside a bus or even like in primary schools of every village, right, you can just take a room and set it up there. And, and, and there, uh, we can't expect doctors to go everywhere because they're busy already, right, and, and doesn't scale to every village. So there being this kind of AI tools will help a health worker. Uh, to enhance her skills, increase her quote, quote, skill set in an artificial fashion, if I, if I can say that, and provide tools in a way that she can use those to provide high quality healthcare uh, in a real time and provisional manner. Right. So that I think the combination of AI tools, which can be used by simple health workers, and a combination of a structure which takes these people to different places, I think this combo is what is the most important place. And with that, I believe, um, you know, we can provide, uh, you know, affordable, accessible healthcare for everyone. You know, I think I'm really looking forward to that day. And, uh, you know, at Niramai, we are really fighting for that cause, right? So we have uh, installations in mobile vans, we made it portable, we are making it even smaller now and more affordable. And most importantly, we have a full training department which can provide this training to any health worker, right? You know, who's just maybe 12th class of us. Hopefully, the day is not too far. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Gida. It was very enlightening and, uh, you know, I hope so many people will look up to you, get inspired and use uh, technologies like AI for a bigger purpose, you know. I mean, I, I remember uh, reading a quote, I can't recall the book, it says, the greatest use of life is to live, a li- live your life in a way that the purpose of your life will become greater than your life. So, I, I'm... Absolutely. I'm very <laughs> much privileged to have this conversation right. and I'm wishing you all the best and uh, maybe we can catch up later when Nirmai will do much bigger things, you know, great to know everything you are doing. Uh, thank you, thank, thank you a lot, Gida, and uh, thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, Chika.